Hey gang, all right, this is the outside Venus. This, this video will be outside Venus and the Venus atmosphere and surface. Um, again, these are ideas for science objectives. You don't have to use these science objectives, you can use your own, but the purpose of these videos is to give you ideas, get the juices flowing, and to show you what we think, sort of a, a you know, what's a, what is a good level for a science objective? What should you be looking at to study? And we'll help you with this too. You guys will give us the ideas and we'll say, well, that's too much or that's too little or whatever. Um, so we'll just jump right in to save time. So outside Venus, again, outside, and by outside Venus, we mean outside the atmosphere. Basically, it's the solar wind interaction with Venus. Um, you could look at that. We've had some teams that have done that in the past. Um, basically, like I said in the introduction video, that uh, Venus either has a very, very weak magnetic field or no magnetic field at all. And what, what happens or what, you know, the result of this is the solar winds that hit Venus. This is Earth, by the way. You guys have probably seen this before, this image. Earth's magnetic field is awesome. I mean, we should, you know, we, we, we owe Earth's magnetic field a debt of gratitude that it blocks, basically. And it's like a big, big blocker, you know, like a big center for us. And um, it, it blocks the solar wind from touching Earth. The solar winds never even get near Earth, really. Uh, but Venus, on the other hand, Venus is, is, is not doing well. Um, Venus has no big center. They have no blocker. It's like a little bitty, um, I don't know, it's like a middle school football team or something. And so, uh, so the solar winds just pummel Venus. And this interaction is interesting because the solar winds themselves induce a magnetic field around Venus, which does some interesting stuff to the upper atmosphere of Venus. And um, it also, it, in, in this image, this is an artist. This is an artist image. It's uh, it's been colorized. They think that it steals elements away from Venus. They think that that they scientists believe that the water was stolen away from Venus through this interaction of the solar winds with the magnetic field with the sorry, with the outer atmosphere of Venus. They think that it stole hydrogen and oxygen away from Venus. But there's but then there's there's still some there, and there's other elements that are that are also light, like hydrogen and oxygen, um, on, on Venus that haven't been stolen away. And so scientists, they're, they're not quite sure what's going on exactly, so this would be a really interesting thing to look at if you wanted to. This would be something you'd have to do from the orbiter. You know, you'd have to stay away from Venus. You couldn't really, I guess if you wanted to, you could be in the atmosphere, looking out, at, out of the atmosphere. That's kind of a tough one to do. It's probably better to look, uh, you know, be, be far away from Venus and look at Venus from afar. But that's the solar wind interaction with Venus. That's outside Venus. There's other things you can look at. Um, Venus has, you know, like we said in the first video, Venus has this retrograde rotation. It would be interesting to try to figure out what occurred to make that happen, but that's something that happened way long time in the past, and we don't know. So, but you could look at the rotation more, more closely, more precisely if you wanted to. But, uh, that, so those are some ideas, potential ideas for outside Venus. Um, so we're traveling inside Venus now. We're in the atmosphere and on the surface. And like I said in the first video, the majority of the, uh, the things that you look at in the atmosphere and the surface of Venus can all be boiled down to properties and composition. Properties are temperatures and pressures. Uh, we'll talk about those, but we'll talk about properties in a second. Compositions are what they're made of. What are the elements, you know, what is it composed of? Composition, what are the elements that are in the atmosphere? or this, the, the soil or whatever. So um, that's why we lump these together, atmospheric and surface measurements. So atmospheric and surface, there are two basic types of atmospheric and surface measurements, properties and composition properties, or the qualities of the atmosphere or the surface. Examples, pressure, temperature, density, viscosity, charge, pH, which is you know, uh, acidity, uh, wind speed, humidity, composition or the constituents of the uh, atmosphere or the, or, uh, sorry, of the atmosphere or the surface. Examples of the elements, the compounds, ions, the salts, the acids, the bases, the minerals, the metals, the biologicals. Bio biologicals are the interesting things for the atmosphere and the surface even as, well, surface, nothing can live that. I don't think anything can live down the surface. But the atmosphere, the biologicals are interesting. You know, scientists want to discover life on Venus. Some, some teams always want to look for life at every planet we go to. So how would you look for life? What is, what is life? What does it mean to be alive? How would you look for life on a different planet? That's a, these are some kind of esoteric questions, but if you say our science objective is to look for life on Venus, and we'll, then we're gonna, our next question is gonna be, what are you actually looking for? What, are you looking for carbon? Are you looking for 
you know, like, are you looking for people to drive in cars? What are you looking for? And so uh, you got to determine what you're actually looking for uh, in the atmosphere or on the surface to determine what life is. Surface only, there's soil mechanics. Um, how hard is this, like the hardness, the penetrability of the soil, stuff like that. There's not much hardness in the atmosphere. There's densities and viscosities, but not any hardness. Um, so properties, these are some basic properties. Um, and I'm going to talk to you and I'll also tell you how those properties are, uh, how we uh, measure those properties, what the instrument is that measures those properties. Pressure is measured by a pressure probe or a transducer. It's a touchy measurement, which means that the, that the pressure transducer actually has to touch uh, the atmosphere or whatever it is it's measuring the pressure of, the, the liquid or, the, or the, the fluid. It has to touch that fluid, the, uh, the pressure transducer does, which makes it interesting. It's a touchy measurement, okay? I'm going to talk about there's touchy measurements and then there's measurements that aren't touchy. Um, touchy ones, uh, they're fine, but you got to remember that you have to design your, uh, your probe, your experiment, such that the, that the instrument can actually touch whatever it is you're measuring. That actually that adds some complexity to it if you start thinking about it. Temperature, temperature and pressure to go together. Temperature is a thermocouple, and we're going to talk about thermocouples at the end of the third video. Thermocouples are interesting. It's also a touchy measurement. Um, so uh, density is a mass. De density is an indirect one. It's you, you, you measure a mass and a volume. Density is a mass over volume. There's, uh, it's an indirect measurement. There's no, there's no such thing as a densometer, really, that I know of. But you measure mass and you measure volume. And so that's how you get density. Viscosity, there's viscometers and there's rheometers. Uh, you can also measure indirectly from something falling through something. You guys have seen those videos of you know a ball falling through oil and water and stuff and how it changes the speed as it falls. Those are viscosity measurements. Charge, uh, there's an electrometer um, or a galvanometer. It's also a touchy measurement. A charge is basically a, uh, a measure of potential energy. Um, so you can use a potentiometer or stuff like that. It's a, there's a charge aspect. There's a charge aspect too, of course. But there's, um, you know, you got a charge built up over here and a, another charge opposite built up over here. So there's potential across that. And how do you measure that potential? Um, how do you measure it, especially when you, if you're in the atmosphere, you know, if you're 50 kilometers in the air, how do you measure that with no ground? Um, so that makes it interesting for you. Um, you start to come, you know, becoming Ben Franklin with a kite, basically. Uh, pH, the acidity basically, you can use an electrode, a pH meter, or there's indicators, pH indicators, you know, you guys use litmus paper in chemistry class, right? So uh, it's a touchy measurement also, the fluid has to touch whatever it is it's measuring the acidity or the pH of. Wind speed, normally wind speed uh, on Earth, it, you know, those guys that drive around in those storm chaser vans, they've got the spinning cups on the top of the van, <laughs> that's called an anemometer. Those things spin and, you know, but the, the tricky thing about an anemometer is one of the things has to be stationary. Like if the van is moving and the wind is moving, you don't know why, if the things are spinning because of the van's movement or the wind movement, right? So the van has to be stationary for the anemometer to work properly, okay? Stationary. You can also measure wind speed through accelerometers. Accelerometers, it's kind of the poor man's way to do it. But uh, we'll talk about more about this in, a, in another video, but there's a uh, relationship between Acceleration, it's a calculus relationship between acceleration, uh, velocity, and displacement. Um, it's basically just calculus, it's integrals and, and um, di you know, and, and differentials. Uh, but there is a, a relationship there. And we've gotten in the last uh, 10 years especially, we've gotten really good at designing accelerometers. There's accelerometers in every smartphone. They've, they've shrunk them down, they're low power now, they're almost, almost non-existent. They're, and you can, they're a dime a dozen basically too. So accelerometers are a great way to measure wind speed. Um, if you can't, if you can't have a stationary thing, you can measure wind speed because you can, because an accelerometer can, knows how fast it's moving and can in, interpret changes in its motion as changes in wind speed. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, da, 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 da. Um, it's an indirect measurement. Can be inferred. Humidity is called a high, you use a hygrometer to measure humidity. Typically requires temperature, pressure, and mass measurements as well. Uh, high, I mean, humidity is one of those things that's dependent on temperature and pressure and mass, stuff like that. So it's not just a, a measurement on its own. Uh, and the precipitation, you can do a rain gauge. It actually rains. Uh, I didn't talk about that. Uh, it rains sulfuric acid on Venus. How cool is that, right? Am I right? 
So the uh, the atmosphere of Venus it rains sulfuric acid. Um, so it, it's cool if you're as, as long as you're not exposed to it, right? Um, so a rain gauge will be interesting. How much? What's the precipitation like on Venus? The rain doesn't hit. That doesn't reach the surface of Venus because the temperature and the pressure are so high at the surface of Venus that basically the rain kind of falls and then gets to a point where it just you know evaporates and goes back up. So it never really kind of rains in the atmosphere basically, but it rains sulfuric acid. There's sulfuric acid clouds on Venus, stuff like that. So um, uh, rain gauge, typically like a rain gauge is something you, you put it out like a cup, put it out there and you go, you look at it and go, yep, two inches and whoops, hey. And um, so but how do you do, how do you do, how do you measure rain uh, if, if, if there's no one there to go, yep, two inches, yep. how do you do that uh, with a payload? So it's an, it's an interesting, interesting measurement, but it's hard to do without um, you know, someone or a trained monkey or something like that there to look at it. So how do you do that? Um, but there's also, there's also directionality involved. You want the rain gauge to point up or you spill all the rain out. Um, all right, so those were properties. And now, like I said, properties and composition is the other, is the other main category of um, uh, science investigations for, this, for, this, for the atmosphere and the surface. And so composition, compos how do you measure composition? Basically you use a mass spectrometer. There's different types of mass spectrometers, there's different kinds, but essentially it's a mass spectrometer that you use to uh, determine composition. You know, what are the constituents, what elements, what molecules, what compounds are in a, a surface or in a certain you know, thing or in an atmosphere, in an area of, of gas or something. So it's an analytical technique. There's a bunch of stuff here. You can read this on the charts on your own. But basically, um, it determines the mass of the particles, and then from that, it uh, um, can tell you what is in a certain thing. Um, the basic procedure is, is behind me, and you can look at the charts on your own, but essentially what happens is, is a laser beam shoots out of the mass spectrometer, or, or uh, the mass spectrometer uses a laser beam, and this laser beam hits whatever it is it's looking at. Let's just say it's looking at this little laser pointer here. That's kind of ironic. So the, the, so the laser beam is going to hit this thing right here, and then when this beam hits this thing, it, uh, it fluoresces. It emits light, okay? And this light is then seen by a camera, okay? And this light has a certain spectrum associated with it. The spectrum, mass spectrometer, the spectrum that is uh, created by this uh, interface, you know, by this interaction of this laser beam and this, you know, whatever the laser, you know, whatever the laser beam is hitting, this spectrum is uh, interpreted by this camera, and the camera reads the spectrum and says, "Oh, there's plastic. I don't know. There's um, carbon. There's uh, poly chains. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know what's in a plastic, but." Um, this camera then it, it sees those it sees the uh the light it sees the spectrum and from that from that spectrum it can tell you what the elements are what the what the composition of that thing is that's how a mass spectrometer works basically in a nutshell um there are two types of mass spectrometers the, the way i define them um if you want to be if you wanted to be overly technical or about this one of them is actually spectroscopy but we won't get into that so um I call them internal and external mass spectrometers. An internal mass spectrometer, basically think of it as a box and everything occurs inside of the box, okay? So you put your substance inside the box, the laser beam shoots inside the box, hits the thing, the, 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 the light is given off and then the camera is inside the box and it sees the light and everything happens inside the box. So very precise, very controlled because it's inside your little box, right? Very controlled aspect of it um however it's tough to get the stuff inside the box sometimes right in the box could be a tube or whatever but basically it's the internal kind now the external kind is what you would see on the the mars rovers that we have out there right now especially like the big one they have these mass spectrometers and they basically they go and they go they they have these little drills it's called the rat the rock abrasion tool it has a drill in the end and then it goes and it drills to pieces of rock and then it shoots it with a laser and it says, oh, that rock has nitrogen, that rock has carbon in it, whatever, you know, but it drills it out and then it shoots a laser and that laser and that fluoresces and the camera sees it and it knows what it is. Um, however, there is uh, distance between the, uh, 
the rock that the that, that is being sampled and the laser beam and so the laser's got to pass through atmosphere along the way so that's going to fluoresce and the camera has to look through the atmosphere so that's going to fluoresce that's going to cause interference and so uh, basically the external it's easier to do typically it's lighter because there's no box involved um, however it's not as controlled it's not as accurate so there's pluses and minuses for both of them um, uh, properties and composition issues with properties and composition as I said earlier there are your touchy measurements where you the uh, the thing that's being measured has to be touched by the probe that's measuring it okay temperature is a great example if I wanted to measure the temperature of my head with this if this were a thermometer I would touch my like those temporal scanner jobbies which are awesome if you have kids and then I have to touch my head with it right they have those laser jobbies that but those don't work that great so don't even think about that those those are kind of remote sensing and um, we don't use those that often in spacecraft. Uh, they use them from orbiting spacecraft, but that's about it. Uh, some properties can be inferred, like viscosity and wind speed. Uh, you take some other measurements and you determine what something is through those measurements. So it's an indirect measurement. Um, spectrometers are not robust, by the way, because there's lasers and there's cameras and stuff. Lasers are typically not robust things because the light has to bounce around inside in order for the laser to work. Um, so Spectrometers are not known for being robust. That means that means if you dropped it, it wouldn't work. That means if it were to fall from an orbiter and hit the ground, it probably would not work. Um, so uh, bear that in mind. Um, and there's a trade. Internal spectrometers are more accurate, but external ones are usually easier and probably less mass. Um, so there you go. So um, those are properties and composition, basically, in a nutshell for uh, the, the atmosphere and the surface, and here are some interesting things to look at. And the atmosphere, we talked about most of these already, the atmosphere, they've got weather in the atmosphere. Venus atmosphere has weather and lightning and storms. It's really cool, and they've got like storms that make our storms look like sissies, okay? Our storms are nothing compared to their storms. Venus has got, it's just got thick atmosphere, really thick clouds. You could be in a cloud for like, if you were skydiving, you'd be like, this cloud is forever, you know? And so, really thick atmosphere. Uh, the greenhouse effect, because of the thick atmosphere, because you can't actually see the surface of Venus from around Venus, the heat just stays trapped inside there. Um, that's something you can look at. That'd be a tough one to actually look at because it's a kind of a systematic, it's a system-wide effect, but you could take a look at uh, some of the parts of the greenhouse effect. The cyclones, this is a picture of the cyclones. This is the North Pole, I think, of Venus, the top of Venus, basically. Uh, the South Pole, they're closer together. They've almost become into one large cyclone. Um, but that's an actual image from an orbiter. Uh, so um, these things, remember, each one of these is the size of Europe. So two or three times bigger than the biggest uh, hurricanes we have on Earth. Crazy, crazy large. And also thick, thick-wise, too. You don't think about our hurricanes being that thick. These things are thick. I mean, like depth. Like if you were to fall through, it would take you a long time. So um, the jet streams on Venus, this is an image of the jet streams. They're very interesting. Earth, we've got one main jet stream that kind of goes from the west to the uh, east on Earth, which is why like, we get our weather from Florence, basically, over in Huntsville. You know, we get, if it hits Florence, it's going to hit Huntsville, basically. You know, so we get our weather that way, and then the trade winds go the other way. Venus has jet streams that go across the entire planet, and there's different levels of jet streams, too. You can look at those. Life. Again, scientists are looking for the life, right? Scientists are looking for aliens. You can look at life in the clouds. What's really interesting about the, uh, some of the cloud layers on Venus, at about 50 kilometers altitude, about where the balloon's going to be, the temperature and the pressure um, in the Venus atmosphere is about like Earth's atmosphere, like Earth's sea level temperature and pressure. Okay? So what that means is, is, the, is the pressure at... Uh, at, at around 50 kilometer altitude is around one atmosphere, one Earth atmosphere, around 14.7 psi, and the temperature is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, room temperature, what we call standard temperature and pressure. That is at around 50 kilometer altitude. So scientists actually believe that, hey, there might be life at 50 kilometer altitude. The only bad thing about 50 kilometers altitude at Venus is the acid rain. That's exactly where the acid rain lives, okay? The acid rain is around that altitude. So um, I don't have a, here's a sort of a image of Venus. 
but the the acid rain clouds are in that altitude range so they they live at, at that all at that at that same altitude also so the uh, temperature and pressure at around 50 kilometer altitude on Venus is quite nice and you'd be like you'd be surfing around like yeah it's nice here it's you know 70 degrees Fahrenheit and one atmosphere sweet however temperature sulfuric acid so you're melting so that's the downside okay um, so but they still might there's there are things on earth that can survive acids right there's extremophiles basically uh, I don't know much about them but I've heard about them and so there are things on earth that can survive extreme environments and can survive acids and high temperatures high pressures they live you know near volcanoes and stuff like that um, near geysers all sorts of all sorts of garbage so uh, there are things on earth that uh, that exist in extreme places and there's also, uh, so the acid rain, again, you can measure the acid rain, the, the, the acidity of it, the, the amount of it, the, the precipitation levels, whatever you want to do. That's something you can measure on Venus as well. Um, and just the atmosphere itself. I mean, it changes drastically. It starts out, you know, at basically nothing and then gets to be 1,400 PSI at the surface. That's crazy as far as, you know, so the temperature starts out really, really, starts out actually quite, quite you know, cold, or actually starts out kind of medium, gets very cold and then gets hot again, very, very hot, around 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, that's hotter than most ovens. Uh, most things stop living at around 400 degrees or something like that. So it's, it's a, uh, um, yeah, so the atmosphere is actually quite interesting. Uh, the surface, again, the surface, you can look at soil mechanics, uh, which are, you know, how hard is the surface? What is it made of? What's it like? This is an image of the uh, surface on the Bonaire mission. This is actually part of the spacecraft. It's not on the surface of itself. So they think the rocks look kind of like broken-y. Broken -y, was that a word? Um, and so uh, you can look at uh, measure magnetic field at the surface. The scientists, the, most of the measurements of magnetic field for Venus have occurred from the atmosphere, have occurred from altitude, because you can't, because it's tough to survive at the surface of Venus. And so measuring the magnetic field at the surface of Venus would be interesting to see if there is, if there really, if there is a weak magnetic field at the surface of Venus or if there are, if just, just not one at all on Venus at all. You can measure some volcanoes. This is an image, again, as an artist image because there's an astronaut right there, which is crazy. But it's an artist image of volcanoes and all sorts of cloud cover on Venus. And then the resurfacing that happened 500 million years ago, you could, you could look at uh, the, um, Venusian surface, the age of it, see if you could find some age spots, see stuff like that. Volcanoes are interesting because this image, sorry, I'm gonna go skip back to that. This image kind of alludes to it, but, um, and in the video about the, uh, the, the for, 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 for Venus Express, they also talk about it, is that as Venus Express was flying over, it would see spots of high sulfur concentration, which scientists think are volcanoes, but they don't know. Venus Express didn't have anything to go down in there and look at them. So that's some interesting stuff if you want to look at that. So you can look, you actually see if there's a volcano. I don't know how you would do that, but that's for you guys to figure out. Um, so that is the end of the surface portion of the video. Um, again, thank you for watching. And we will, uh, again, the next video is going to be subsurface, and then we'll end with some instruments. Thanks.